Right. Thanks, Arit. Um, yeah, so uh, today I'm going to talk about quadratic form maximization over convex sets, and this is joint work with Uyung Lee and Asaf Naur. Let's begin. Right, so formally I'm interested in approximation algorithms for the following two problems. Okay, so I'm given a matrix A, uh, an N cross N matrix A, and I want to maximize X transpose AX, that is summation AIJ, XI, XJ, such that X ranges over a convex set C. Okay, um, I'm, uh, I'm interested in both this problem and a closely related variant called bilinear maximization where you want to maximize X transpose BY, where X ranges over a convex set C1 and Y ranges over a convex set C2. So for the purpose of this talk, for simplicity, the convex sets are going to be origin symmetric. That is, um, whenever X belongs to the set C, negative X also belongs to the set C. Okay, and I assume that the convex set is given by a membership oracle. Okay, and uh, it turns out that, that Bilinear maximization is a special case of quadratic maximization. However, the, the reason I'm interested in both is because quadratic maximization, it's more general. So, so for that reason, I'm interested in quadratic. Whereas for bilinear maximization, somehow it has enough structure that it admits constant factor approximation algorithms in a wider range of settings. Also, there is an important interplay between quadratic and bilinear maximization that comes in handy both in algorithms and hardness, and, and this is the other reason why I'm going to, I'm going to consider both throughout. Uh, to, to see quickly why quadratic maximization is more general than bilinear maximization, um, let's say B is the operator for bilinear maximization, the matrix for bilinear maximization. We just take a two cross two uh, block matrix um, as follows, right? Um, we take A as 0, 0, B over 2, B transpose over 2. And then we take our convex set C as the Cartesian product of C1 and C2. Okay, it is easily checked that um, Z transpose AZ is equal to Z1 transpose BZ2, where Z is the concatenation of Z1 and Z2. Okay, um, using this observation, the maximum of Z transpose AZ over C is the same as the maximization of X transpose BY, where X is in C1 and Y is in C2. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'll start with some preliminaries about norms in this talk. So all norms in this talk are over Euclidean space, Rn, n dimensions. And I'm gonna denote them by norm sub X and norm sub Y and so on. Okay. Um, uh, there is a well-known equivalence and function analysis between norms and origin symmetric convex bodies. Specifically, given a norm X, the, the convex body is defined as the unit ball of this norm. That is the set of points that have norm at most one. Okay? And given, a, given an origin symmetric convex body B, one can define a norm as the, as the minimum scaling of the body that contains a vector X. Okay? So the norm of X is defined as the minimum scaling of the body that contains the vector X. Okay? Right, and more standard uh, terminology. So the dual norm of X, denoted by X star, um, is defined as the maximum inner product with a unit vector in the X norm. Okay, so the dual norm X star of C is the maximum inner product of X and C, where X ranges over the unit ball of capital X. Okay, as an example, um, for the LP norms, the dual norm turns out to be the LP star norm, where P star satisfies one over P plus one over P star equals one. Okay, I'll go, and go into this in more detail on the next slide. Okay, so just a, just a reminder on what LP norms are. So given a vector X, the LP norm of the vector is the summation of the pth powers of the absolute values of the entries, whole to the one over P, okay? And on the right, I, I gave three examples of the unit ball of, of LP norms. The, 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 middle, the middle circle, the, the one in blue, is uh, the unit ball of L2. The innermost uh, square is the unit ball of L1. And the outermost square is the unit ball of L infinity. Okay. And uh, you know, as I said earlier, the dual norm is given by LP star where one over P star plus one over P is equal to one. Okay, it just so happens that the supremum definition coincides with LP star. 
in this case. Okay, so for example, L1 is the dual of L infinity in the figure, and L2 is dual to itself. Okay, another example of this, the outermost, the outermost ball here is the ball of L5, and the innermost ball is the ball of five fourths, the dual of five. Okay, so whenever P is greater than two, the dual P star is less than two. Okay. Right, so, so now I, I want to give a second interpretation of, of uh, bilinear maximization to give people more intuition for what this quantity is. Um, so given a matrix A, okay, uh, M cross N matrix A, I can think about it as an operator from a norm space X to a norm space Y, a linear map from a norm space X to a norm space Y. And I define its operator norm as the maximum amount that it stretches a unit vector where the stretch is measured in the destination norm Y and unit vector is defined using the source norm X. Okay, so it's the maximum of AX Y norm such that X is in the unit ball of capital X. Okay, now simply by the duality fact or the definition of the dual norm that I showed in the previous slide, um, this is equal to the maximum of, of it, uh, of the bilinear form y transpose ax where y is in the y star unit ball okay and um, throughout this talk it's going to be convenient to switch back and forth between this bilinear version and the operator norm version and the easiest way to tell them apart is i will denote the bilinear version with the comma uh, as in here on the right and i will denote the operator norm version with an arrow as in here on the left okay um, right, so, so here's an example. So let, let's say A is a linear map mapping L5 to L1. Okay, so, so I take the L5 unit ball and I apply the linear map A. It, it uh, uh, stretches the L5 unit ball somehow. Right? And the operator norm of A is nothing but the L1 radius of this stretch L5 unit ball. Okay, so let's, let's see some concrete examples. In the case where the convex set C is the unit ball of L2, this is the well-known maximum eigenvalue. That is, uh, I'm using the Raleigh quotient definition of the maximum eigenvalue. That is, ma maximize X transpose AX such that X is in the Euclidean unit ball. Okay, and of course, this is exactly computable. On the other hand, the bilinear version of the problem, maximize X transpose AY, X and Y are in the Euclidean unit ball. This is nothing but the maximum singular value of the matrix. Again, exactly computable, okay? The only time these two quantities don't coincide is when the, the maximum eigenvalue is not equal to the maximum magnitude eigenvalue. Okay, yeah, so another familiar example. So if we're, if we're in the quadratic case and uh, we consider the L infinity unit ball, that is the plus minus one hypercube, the convex hull of the plus minus one hypercube. And we take our matrix A to be the Laplacian of a graph, then this is exactly the maximum, max, maximum cut of the graph, okay? And uh, Gomez and Williamson gave a semi-definite programming based constant factor approximation algorithm for this problem. Um, and uh, to, to do so, they introduced hyperplane rounding in the computer science community. And uh, yeah, it's a seminal paper. Um, similarly, the bilinear L infinity L infinity version um, with, with no constraint on the matrix A is, corresponds to the famous Groth and Dieck's inequality. Okay, so uh, implicit in an in inequality that Groth and Dieck proved is, is, is the fact that a certain natural semi definite programming relaxation for bilinear maximization is a constant factor approximation to the objective. Okay. Um, the exact value of growth index constant is still an outstanding open problem, and there have been several works improving this constant and trying to understand its exact value, the most recent being Braverman et al's work. Okay. Um, the quadratic version of L infinity is also interesting. This was introduced by Alon et al in the context of defining the growth index constant of a graph. Okay. And an interesting and subtle separation between the bilinear and quadratic case is evident in, in the case of L infinity. Um, 
that is log n turns out to be the best approximation one can get for quadratic maximization over l infinity uh, and uh, and however like one of the surprising aspects of growth and decay inequality is that you can get a constant factor approximation in the bilinear case okay and this log n is tight one cannot do better in the quadratic case okay so another um, another important special case is the case of hypercontractive norms um, so uh, notice that i now transition to to the uh, operator norm version it will be more convenient to talk about operator norms here um, so the p to q norm of um, of a matrix where p is less than q um, uh, sort of uh, uh, yeah corresponds to corresponds to the case where we study hypercontractive inequality if you don't know what this is don't worry um, one important fact that it does satisfy is that uh, if we, if you have a graph and you take the matrix a to be the projector to the top eigen space of this matrix then all small sets in the graph are expanding if and only if the projector to the top eigen space has small 2 to q norm where q is greater than 2 okay this is this is a nice fact established by barak et al um, in the next slide i will go into this in more detail to give some intuition for why this is true okay this this connection ends up being important uh, important to us for complexity theoretic reasons small set expansion is an important problem in complexity theory related to the unique games conjecture right and uh, uh, for whenever whenever p is less than q it turns out that a polynomial approximation factor is the best norm okay yeah so so now i just want to slightly flesh out this connection to small set expansion um now a bound on any hypercontracted norm of of the adjacency matrix of a graph uh, implies a bound on the small set expansion of the graph okay that is it it implies that the graph is a small set expander okay so for simplicity we assume that the graph g is deregular okay and recall that the expansion of a graph is defined as uh, uh, the expansion of a set s sorry is defined as um, the number of edges that leave s divided by the total number of edges in, involved in s okay so the so the denominator is d times uh, d times s this is the total number of edges involved in s uh, and uh, the number of edges between s and s complement is the fraction of uh, i mean is the number of edges leaving s so the expansion of s is defined as the fraction of edges leaving s okay uh, now one can see easily that the the fraction of edges one minus the fraction of edges leaving s is equal exactly to 1s transpose ag 1s where one s is the indicator vector of the set s okay divided by d times size of s okay and now simply using you know the definition of of bilinear maximization uh, from the earlier slide we obtain that this is at most the operator norm of a times the q star norm of the indicator vector s times the p norm of the indicator vector s okay and this of course is a uh, i mean one can just calculate directly is is the operator norm divided by d times s to the 1 over p minus 1 over q okay one can see from this exponent that that we get an interesting bound only when p is less than q okay um, that is you know we we get a bound that that gets better as the set s gets smaller only when p is less than q Okay, so this kind of this is one explanation for why um, p less than q is important for small set expansion. Okay, and Barak et al. indeed made this connection two-sided for the two to q norm, and you know, uh, uh, not for the matrix A, but a matrix A related to uh, a matrix A prime related to A, specifically a projector to the top eigenspace. Okay. Right, so let's let's see some more okay, examples. Can I slow you down a little bit? Sure. Yeah. So sorry. So, I mean, from this expression, if p is bigger than q, you still you get a negative power, which is even better. 
yeah so you get a negative power and somehow this gives you a bound on the expansion for large sets and it's not necessarily yeah so i mean the connection to small set expansion breaks down mm -hmm. yeah I, mean, I guess i'm not saying something too deep here it's just uh, um perhaps one okay more. so basically your your point is this if we have in the setting that p is smaller than q then what you see here is you get a power of s that's smaller than one yeah uh, you, um, you get a power of s that's positive yeah. whereas if p is greater than q you get a power of s that's negative yeah the fact that it's positive isn't enough i, th I think it's also it needs to be smaller than one somehow but if you want something that goes uh, to zero as S goes down. So you want a positive power. The smaller S is. Yeah, the, the better. Gets smaller. Yeah, and Irith, if you're worried about some normalization factor, it's, it's often the case that people define P to Q norm with expectation norms. And so actually there will be a N to the one over P minus one over Q in the denominator. I see. You're not defining it with expectations here. No, no. Uh, I guess for, for most of the time today, it's more convenient to be in the counting numbers. Okay. Yeah. Um, right. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So let's, let's see some examples beyond LP. Um, so now when, when I take the norm as Shatton infinity, so this is just another name for the maximum singular value. So uh, oh. I have another, it's not a question exactly, but uh, it's more related to the slowing down. We are in a phase where you are just motivating this uh, question that you are going to study in general of optimizing over general convex sets and just giving us lots yes. of examples of where it shows up. Yes, yes. Good, yes. so that's, uh, yeah. And then you'll tell us when you switch to the, yeah. So yeah. this hypercontractivity and small set expansion is one motivation and uh, yeah yeah uh, it's, it's one motivation of uh, max cut and cut norms uh, uh, and the approximation uh, ratios uh, will be maybe special cases of something you'll develop uh, yes yes exactly okay. yeah. right um right so yeah so yet another example um is an, a non-lp example is when you take the Shatton infinity norm. So now I'm thinking of an n square cross n square matrix as my instance, and it maps, it's a linear map from the set of n cross n matrices to the set of n cross n matrices. And the norm that I, that I think of, uh, uh, the convex body is the unit ball of this norm, um, is Shatton infinity. Where Shatton infinity is the maximum singular value of a matrix. It's just another, another way of saying that. In general, Shatton P norm is defined as apply the LP norm to the, to the singular values of the matrix, okay? So if we apply the L infinity norm to the singular values of a matrix, we get the maximum singular value, okay? This actually corresponds to uh, another famous inequality known as the non-commutative Grothendieck inequality. This was conjectured by Grothendieck back in 1953, and you know, it took several years for uh, PCA to affirmatively resolve this question uh, in the sense that he, he showed implicitly that a certain natural semi-definite programming relaxation, again, achieves a constant factor approximation to this objective, the bilinear maximization over Shatton infinity. Okay. And now Raghav and Vidic algorithmicize, given algorithmic grounding algorithm for this, um, uh, algorithmicizing a, a different sharper uh, inequality due to Hagerup. Okay, and they use this to show very nice applications to to several areas, quantum XR games, you know, some uh, principal component analysis, etc. cetera. Okay. Um, yet another example uh, of a combinatorial optimization problem that is captured is if we take the norm to be the max of L infinity and L1 divided by K, okay, the quadratic version, this is nothing but the densest subgraph on K vertices, assuming the instance is the adjacency matrix of a graph. Okay. Um, this is another combinatorial optimization problem whose complexity is, uh, is greatly studied. 
again i can go on you know there are several several more interesting problems both from inner proximability and approximability standpoint uh, that this framework captures vertex expansion is one um, a notable example is kxor so um, it you know this this framework is is so powerful that it actually captures problems of higher degree so it turns out with the clever choice of the convex set c quadratic maximization can actually capture degree 3 polynomial maximization over a convex set okay so it's it's deceptively it's deceptively expressive okay um right so uh, before i go on to to what questions uh, uh, i'm interested in regarding quadratic maximization um i just want to recap you know sort of uh, some of the some of the important phenomena in approximation algorithms okay specifically how do we design approximation algorithms for combinatorial optimization problems okay so let's say you're given some combinatorial optimization problem uh, the standard paradigm is to relax this problem to a convex program what do i mean by this you have some some feasible region possibly complicated uh, like this yellow region right and we relax it to a more tractable region okay so so for example let's say we were trying to do linear function maximization over a set s1 that is complicated right complicated can mean either that it's not convex or it could mean that it's convex but we we um don't have i mean it's sort of implicitly defined so we don't have a succinct description of the set okay um or a separation oracle for that matter right so we relax it to a different set s2 that is convex and is separable what do i mean by separable um whenever a point is outside the set s2 there is an algorithm to find a hyperplane separating the point from the set s2 okay and you know an important paradigm in convex optimization is that whenever you have such a separation oracle um it is possible to maximize say a linear function over this set okay um i'll briefly go into why this is possible um, so i'll i'll briefly describe one method to do this which is known as the ellipsoid method right um right so so let's say you want to solve you know you want to maximize approximately a linear function a in a product x over the set s2 okay using binary search um for for the optimal value you can you can actually reduce this maximization problem to log n many feasibility problems of the form is a in a product x at least lambda um such that x belongs to s2 for some s well for some x okay so is is this region empty or not okay so just using using a decision using a yes no oracle for this question and just by binary search we can reduce maximization of the linear function um approximately losing like an inverse exponential additive term uh we can reduce it to to log n many such feasibility problems okay and now we're going to use the ellipsoid method to solve this feasibility problem right how does the ellipsoid method work so let's say c lambda is is your set for some fixed value of lambda that that you, that you want to check right um we assume you're given some ellipsoid that contains c lambda okay and now you query if the center of the ellipsoid is inside c lambda or not if it's not you use your separation oracle to get a hyperplane separating c lambda from from the center okay and then you actually compute a new ellipsoid to uh, that that contains this new feasible region okay where uh, that that you know contains c lambda okay and then you repeat so you again query the center of this new ellipsoid and if it's not inside the set c lambda you get a separation oracle and you keep going now after polynomially many iterations you either you either obtain a point inside the set c lambda in which case you can conclude it's non empty or after polynomially many iterations the volume of of the set that you are left with is so small that that declaring that it's empty will not hurt your objective well okay so this is a high level description of why ellipsoid method works okay right so coming back to our paradigm for combinatorial optimization so you relax the combinatorial optimization problem 
to a convex program, a computable convex program, right? And you compute the value. Okay, and it turns out that this is often the best, you know, often the best polytime approximation algorithm looks like this under certain complexity assumptions. Okay. And also, you know, often when, when we have such an algorithm, uh, it also comes with what's known as the rounding algorithm. So for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to define a rounding algorithm as, as follows. It's any algorithm that maps a point in the outer feasible region, every point in the outer feasible region, to some point in the inner feasible region. Okay. If you, if you have a randomized rounding algorithm, I allow you to map any point in the outer feasible region to a distribution over points in the inner feasible region. Okay. So the uh, hope is that, uh, you know, this rounding will not affect the objective too much. Yes, yes. So, so typically, like a way that you, you argue that, uh, that the relaxation is not too bad is by using such a rounding algorithm. It's, it's uh, I mean, not only is it a mechanism for, um, mechanism for showing that the relaxation is not too bad, um, uh, so, so as you know, for example, here you, you, we only get this inequality trivially, right? Because S two is larger than S one, but we are also hoping that the set S two is you know not too much worse than S one. Maximizing over S two is not too much worse, and uh, often we argue that it's not too much worse most of the time. In fact, by by using a rounding algorithm, because we need to upper bound this by alpha times the left-hand side. No, my point was that you can map the outer region to the inner region, sending all the points in the outer region to a fixed point in the inner one. This would not be too interesting. Oh, yes, yes, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah. You need some quality of the... Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, so I, I, I yeah, yeah, so I, I am allowing you to have pathological rounding algorithms that don't uh, that are not interesting, but uh, but yes, yeah. So so a rounding algorithm is only interesting when, yeah, when uh, uh, when it's able to prove that uh, uh, the relaxations value is bounded, or rather, a rounding algorithm is only interesting when uh, it always obtains value within an alpha factor of the optimum. Right. Yeah. So let's let's see some concrete examples of this phenomenon. Right. So Raghavendra in 2008 showed that for a very wide class of combinatorial optimization problems, known as constraint satisfaction problems, a certain natural semi-definite programming relaxation is the best approximation algorithm in polynomial time, assuming a complexity conjecture known as the Nick games conjecture. Okay. Uh, this is sort of an amazing result and is one of my primary motivations. Um, some, some more examples of this phenomenon closer to our context. So in the case of uh, growth and decrease inequality, that is bilinear maximization over the hypercube, a certain natural semi-definite programming relaxation is the best approximation algorithm, again, under the unique games conjecture. Yeah, this was established by Raghavendra and Stroyder. Right. Another example um, is, you know, uh, is a very similar setting. You, uh, quadratic maximization over the LP unit ball um, has a certain natural convex programming relaxation. This time it's not an STP. Yeah. Um, and I, I will discuss this later in the talk and I will state the relaxation. Um, so it turns out that this is the best approximation algorithm unless P equals MP. Okay, this is the result of Goroswami et al. And another result, uh, which is a non-LP result, um, is yeah bilinear maximization over Shatton infinity. Um, it turns out uh, again that the semi-definite programming relaxation is the best. Again, unless uh, is the best assuming p doesn't equal mp. Okay, the the algorithm was established by Nauer, Regev, and Vidic, and the hardness result was established by Brie, Regev, and Sakev. I just want to point out that the latter two results are somewhat remarkable in that. Um, we have these optimality results assuming only P doesn't equal NP and not the unique games conjecture. Okay. Um, 
Right. So, so now that I sort of um, give a brief description of approximation algorithms, I'm ready to state what my goals are. So my goal is basically to extend this theory of approximation algorithms to quadratic and bilinear maximization. Right? And, and my hope is that you know, this theory, right, a, a unified theory, can be used for both algorithmic and impossibility results, new algorithmic and impossibility results for continuous and combinatorial optimization. Okay. Um, I hope I've convinced you that the framework is very expressive and so such a pursuit is worthwhile. Right, so, so more concretely, I'm interested in the following question. How does the approximability of quadratic maximization depend on the geometry of X and Y? So we saw earlier that sometimes we have constant factor approximation algorithms and sometimes we, we don't know anything better than polynomial. And uh, I want to understand what is it about the geometry of the norms that influences this? Okay, secondly, so yeah, uh, when do constant factor approximation algorithms exist? Right. Um, right. I also want to understand when is convex programming the optimal algorithm, or rather, what is the optimal algorithm and what does it look like? Um, and lastly, yeah, what, what does the optimal rounding algorithm look like for general convex bodies? Insofar, in approximation algorithms, um, the, the theory of rounding, rounding has been developed only for discrete settings like the hypercube um, or you know, bounded size alphabet and so on. And so it would be nice to develop this in a continuous optimization context as well. Right, so um, uh, I'm, I'm now ready to state vaguely what, what our main results are. So we give a generic framework for quadratic maximization. Okay, we, don't, we don't obtain a characterization, um, but we give a generic framework for quadratic maximization that has the following features. Firstly, it encompasses the situations where constant factor approximation algorithms were known. However, we sometimes get worse constants, and this is the cost of being generic. Right? And we also provide a rich family of new examples where constant factor approximation is possible. And finally, we obtain dichotomy theorems in special cases. So if we can assume that the norms are, say, invariant to permutation and sign flips, then we obtain a Raghavendra-like theorem, uh, a slightly weaker version. Okay, and similarly, um, uh, if the norm is a unitarily invariant matrix norm, so the maximum singular value is one such example. In general, you know, Shatten P, where you take the LP norm of the singular values of a matrix, if this is your norm, this is unitarily invariant. Um, right, so for such norms, again, we also obtain a dichotomy theorem. Okay, so what do I mean by this? I mean that we give an algorithm that gets an alpha approximation for these problems. And if alpha is really bad, as in it scales, um, it, it grows very, lar uh, very quickly with n, then no algorithm can get a constant factor approximation. Okay, this is the result. I'll state this formally towards the end of the talk again. Okay. Right, so, so the rest of the talk is laid out as follows. Um, I'm first going to, you know, to uh, describe what was known before and what the prior approach to quadratic maximization was. Um, and uh, to do this, it's, uh, yeah, I will, I will describe quadratic maximization over LP norms. LP norms are quite fundamental as, as we'll see later in the talk. Um, somehow understanding the LP case completely is crucial. Um, this is partly because of Ramsey theoretic results that uh, embed LP norms inside other norms. Okay. Um, next, I'll, I'll also show um, what was known beyond LP. So, you know, how, um, what situations we knew constant factor approximation algorithms that weren't LP norms. And lastly, I'll, co I'll cover our generic framework. Okay, so any, any questions before I uh, move on with the first part of the talk? Right, yeah, so, so quadratic maximization over LP norms, right? I'll begin by, by showing you um, the approach in the case where the convex set is the hypercube, the convex cell of the hypercube plus minus one hypercube. Okay, so recall our objective is maximize X transpose AX, that is summation AIJ, XI, XJ, such that the absolute value of all entries is at most one. 
and uh, and now we 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 take a natural vector relaxation of this quantity um it's actually a semi definite programming relaxation right but we replace every vector xi uh, every scalar xi by a vector ui okay and so and so we look at summation aij times ui inner product uj right and we replace the absolute value constraint by an l2 norm constraint okay so ui l2 norm is at most one if you're wondering why we pick l2 norm out of all other norms it's because in order for this to be a convex program our variables are actually the inner products they are not the vectors ui so the variables of our convex program are actually the inner products of the vectors and so we needed some quantity that we can express as an inner product so uh, just a, another way of writing this is uh, uh, maximizing you know summation aij ui inner product uj where the uh, ui inner product with itself is at most one okay i'm going to write it yet another way where it's going to be evident why this is a convex program okay so so the above is the same as writing uh, maximize the inner product of a with a matrix bold x right such so that bold x is psd and the diagonal entries of bold x are at most one okay so so this matrix bold x is exactly the matrix of inner products of the vectors u okay so um, so this is going to be our vector relaxation right and we're going to show that the the vector relaxation's value approximates oct okay um so the first inequality is trivial okay so the vector relaxation is always at least opt because you know given an optimal solution x we can define ui to be the elementary vector scaled by xi okay so let's say the elementary vector in the first coordinate so all the uis are elementary vector in the first coordinate scaled by xi and it turns out that uh, this will exactly capture uh, opt okay um so the non trivial inequality is the second inequality and this is what i'm going to show you now so opt is at least convex program divided by log n okay to do this it's helpful to keep the following rounding algorithm in mind okay we we sample iid standard gaussians gamma 1 through gamma n by standard i mean unit variance and zero mean okay and and we set the variable gi to be the inner product of this gaussian iid gaussian vector with the vector ui okay so gi is intuitively you know um, a proxy for what we want uh, what we want to set as xi okay so we're trying to we're trying to set uh, our variable xi okay uh, uh, vijay yes yeah so um, yeah one one thing that's uh, not clear from the description of the a uh, semi definite program is uh, that there is a dimension bound on the vectors ui and right, uh, right. there is always one which is the n let's say that's one point but the other point is not clear that the sol solver for the relaxation uh, gives you back uis it seems to give you back only the inner product matrix and you want to say that you get uis and you want to get from them a scalar solution right thanks avi right yeah so um as avi said um so if if x is the is the matrix of inner products of the U, uis um uh, there is this yeah i mean uh, we we can obtain such uis by by um by taking the eigen decomposition of the matrix x okay and uh, by the spectral theorem it uh, and and since the rank of the matrix x is at most n it turns out that these vectors ui have dimension at most n so we can we can always assume without loss of generality that these uis have dimension at most n assuming bold x is an n cross n matrix right so um so the rounding strategy is as follows so we set gi to be the inner product of this standard gaussian vector with ui okay and and now we you know intuitively we want to set g to be our solution vector um i'll mention why soon uh but but it may not it may not have l infinity norm at most one that is it may not be inside the hypercube we need to 
we need to output a vector inside the hypercube. And so we, we take the naive strategy of just dividing by its maximum entry. So we return G divided by its L infinity now. Uh, one more point, uh, Vijay. Uh, just uh, another way of saying it is a natural thing. You have an n-dimensional vector and you want a scalar, so you just project it on a random direction. You formally state it as picking these Gaussians, but at least it's a natural idea to right. project your vector on one random direction, all the vectors on one random direction, and right. take the, these inner products. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Thanks again, Avi. Yeah. Um, as Avi said, you know, we think of each of these vectors as as representing our variable i. Um, and, you know, one natural way to to round it to a scalar is to take the projection of a of a random of a vector in a random direction onto this vector ui. Right. And uh, another thing I forgot to mention, um, there is an alternate way of saying this. So, um, uh, every yeah, I mean, uh, sampling sampling this Gaussian vector g i in this way, th this Gaussian vector g in this way, is equivalent to sampling a Gaussian vector from the covariance matrix bold x. Okay. Um, uh, because of the because of the fact that a Gaussian distribution is uniquely given by its second moments, um, the, these two these two sampling schemes are equivalent. Okay. So later on in the talk, I will I will often refer to um, yeah refer to the refer to the sampling procedure as just sampling G from the covariance matrix bold X. Okay, um, right. So now, why is convex program the convex program an approximation to opt? Um, well, by simply by definition, you know the way we sample GIs, um, the expectation of GI times GJ, the covariance, is equal to the ijth entry of X of bold x, right? Therefore, by linearity of expectation, we have expectation of G transpose AG is equal to the matrix A inner product with bold x, okay? We are assuming bold x is the optimal solution of our convex program. So we're taking the optimal solution of our convex program and sampling these Gaussians. Um, and so the expected value, so expectation of G transpose AG is equal to the convex program's value. So there we get this equality, right? And then just by the definition of, of opt, that is just by the definition of quadratic maximization and scaling, um, this is at most opt times the L infinity norm of G squared. Okay, um, just as a reminder, this is an alternate way to write opt on the right hand side. Okay, and now um, we, we use the fact that the expected max uh, the expected maximum of n Gaussians, n standard Gaussians, squared is is roughly log n. Okay, this this fact is quite easy to prove. So first, observe that each of these are standard Gaussians because we had the constraint that each ui is an L2 unit vector. Okay, so if we take the inner product of a vector of standard Gaussians with a unit vector, we get a standard Gaussian back. Okay, uh, so each of these gi's is a standard Gaussian. And the expected max of n standard Gaussians is at most log n. This can be proved easily by union bound. So any single Gaussian is at most um, square root log n with probability one over n. And then we just take union bound over all n Gaussians with probability one minus one over n, sorry. And then we just take union bound. Uh, Vijay? Yeah. The, just one more point. You, you went fast over point 1a. Uh -huh. uh, where I guess it's uh, essential that sampling uh, by projection on random lines is pairwise independent, which is, I guess, a common uh, right in right. random in uh, in rounding algorithms. Right, right, yeah, um, right. So if we if we look at expectation of of gamma inner product U I times gamma inner product U J, and we just distribute the summation. And, and apply linearity of expectation, um, we can prove that the expectation of gamma inner product ui times gamma inner product uj is equal to the inner product of ui and uj, which is nothing but bold x ij entry. Right, um, 
Okay, so this this completes the log n approximation for the for the quadratic L infinity case. Okay. Um, similarly, let's let's consider the more general LP case. And uh, as usual, you know, opt is defined as maximize x transpose a x, and now x is in the LP unit ball. Okay, and uh, we again look at a natural vector relaxation, um, the maximum of a i j times u i u j. J, sorry, can I also ask you a quick question? Yeah, sure. Um, can you give some intuition why would you use Gaussian in some in this in this scenario? Why not any other? I don't know any other distribution possible. Right. So, so one of the one of the biggest reasons is that um, is that a Gaussian is uniquely given by its second moment. So, if you think of this matrix X as say the covariance of some distribution, um, it it's not actually clear how to sample from this covariance matrix. The the only distribution where we know how to sample from from any covariance matrix is the Gaussian distribution, or is uh, the multivariate Gaussian distribution that has these second moments. So, for example, if I tell you that X is the covariance matrix of some uh, distribution over the hypercube, um, I mean it, it's it's very good for you. Um, it means that uh, X has value. Uh, I mean, yeah, it means it would in particular mean that the convex program has value one, uh, sorry, it has a one approximation to opt, but it's not clear how to sample from this. Can I say something else? Yes. Uh, I think another intuition is that in this uh, algorithm, the matrix A is not really used. I mean, it's used by the algorithm that solves the convex program, but we don't uh, really use it in the analysis other than doing linearity of expectation. So uh given this uh, ignorance uh it seems that the vectors ui could have been rotated in space without our knowing it so it makes sense to fix to pick something which is spherically symmetric yeah. and spherically symmetric is basically picking random gaussian you could pick a random point on the sphere on the unit sphere but then you wouldn't have the independence that you need in 1a so you pick the, something as close as being as, as close as you can to being a random direction, namely a random point on the sphere. And if you do it independently, the, you know, then the spherically symmetric distribution, which is a Gaussian distribution, is as close as you can, as best as you can do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Avi's explanation is actually much better. Yeah. So in fact, if you rotate the UIs um, by any orthonormal rotation. This this matrix bold x does not change. So if you want a sampling strategy that is um, that is the same uh, for a fixed matrix bold x, uh, it is natural to consider a rotation invariant strategy. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. So 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 more generally, going to the LP case. Um, opt is given by x transpose a x, where x is in the LP unit ball, and now we, you know, we follow our nose and re we relax it in a similar manner. So, so now we look at summation a i j u i inner product u j again, um, replacing scalars by vectors, and and now we replace this constraint by the summation of the pth powers of the L two nodes, being at most one. Okay, another way to write this. Um, in a way that makes it more evident when the program is convex and when it isn't, um, is again a inner product bold face x, so it's that x is PSD, bold x is PSD, and the summation of the p over twoth powers of the diagonal entries is at most one. Okay, and now we we get the strange phenomenon that that this program is convex if and only if p is at least two. Okay. And it turns out um, that uh, whenever p is at least two, we get a constant factor approximation by an analysis that is very analogous to what I showed you before. Okay, so we have convex program is at least opt is at least convex program divided by roughly p. Okay, so for any fixed p, um, p at least two, p at most infinity, um, we get a constant factor approximation. Okay, and uh, 
uh, this was independently proved by Guru Swami et al. and also Nauer and Shatman. Okay. Uh, well, okay. So for p at least two, we have a constant factor approximation. What about what about p less than two? Right. So it it turns out that the best approximation we know when p is less than two is is polynomial in n. Okay. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm just uh, summarizing pictorially what I showed you earlier. We get a constant factor approximation when p is at least two and strictly less than infinity. And when p is equal to infinity, this is what I just showed you regarding the hypercube, you get a log n approximation. Okay. And uh, indeed, it, it turns out that uh, you, can, you can get some complexity evidence that there is no constant factor approximation algorithm when p is less than 2. Okay. And uh, this, this follows from this connection to small set expansion I mentioned earlier. Um, so, uh, morally, the four thirds to four norm captures small set expansion uh, for reasons that I mentioned earlier, right? And by the equivalence between bilinear maximization and operator norm that I mentioned towards the start of the talk, um, the four thirds to four norm is roughly the same as, uh, sorry, is exactly the same as bilinear maximization over four thirds comma four thirds, okay? And so bilinear maximization over L four thirds captures small set expansion. Okay, and an important complexity conjecture. An important problem that is hard for complexity. Uh, yeah, that is conjectured to be hard in complexity theory. And now by the reduction I showed you at the start of the talk, um, that quadratic maximization is, a, is more general than bilinear maximization. One can capture bilinear maximization over L four thirds by um, quadratic maximization over L four thirds in twice the dimension. Okay, using this two cross two block matrix that I showed. Right. So now, so now we actually see that uh, that you know, uh, assuming small set expansion is a hard problem, you can't solve LP quadratic maximization when p is less than two. So I want to point out it's it's quite remarkable here that uh, uh, this is a certain natural vector relaxation. And the convexity of this relaxation, so when the relaxation is convex and when it isn't, predicts precisely when a reasonable approximation algorithm is possible in the case of LP norms. This is somewhat reminiscent of, of uh, the phenomenon in constraint satisfaction problems. Right. Yeah, so now let's let's view um, some some results beyond LP norms or what was known beyond LP norms. And what was... Question. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you mentioned some uh, Ramsey theoretic results that uh, uh, sort of uh, also are uh, involved with this. So there's this old results of Asaf uh, now and Lineal, which also have a, a breakdown sort of phase transition at uh, at two. This is related to what you said so far, or will become uh, related later? It, 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 yeah, I will, I will mention concretely what results I was uh, specifying later. Um, I don't know exactly the our linear result you mentioned. So I guess I am referring to even older uh, uh, stuff. Oh, that's very old. That's when Asaf was a student. <laughs> ah, okay, okay. <laughs> that's in his thesis. <laughs> I see, I see. So, I mean, uh, perhaps that was related to metrics then? Uh... Uh, well, it was about embeddings. Uh, well, anyway, we will get to it, we'll see. Right, right. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, right, okay, yeah, so, so let's survey some results uh, beyond LP norms. Right? Uh, again, the approach is going to be similar. We're going to we're going to try you know wherever possible to define a convex programming relaxation and solve it and hope that it gets a constant factor approximation. Ah, sorry, just one question about the um, earlier part. Uh, any hope of bridging the gap between just super constant and polynomial? Right. So so if you assume um, SSC and ETH. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry. If you if you assume SSE does not have a quasi-polynomial time approximation algorithm, um, uh, then you can you can boost this hardness factor to two to the log to the one minus epsilon, so almost polynomial. Okay. Um, to get polynomial, I think this is related to de-randomization, and yeah, it's probably outstanding open problem. 
Okay. Right. So, um, right. So again, you know, more generally, um, what people tried to do was, uh, uh, you know, try and check all the situations where um, you obviously have a convex programming relaxation, solve it, and hope it gets a constant factor approximation. So I'm going to mention um, one result in 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 that in that spirit. Um, so yeah. So so now we're in the most general setting, say. We want to maximize x transpose a x and little x is in the unit ball of capital X, right? And then you you again you know you write down a natural vector relaxation that need not be convex. Right? So you look at um, maximum maximum of a i j u i inner product u j, and now the vector of L two norms of the u i s must belong to the unit ball of x. Okay, this is a generalization of the constraint I showed for L p norms and for L infinity norms. But written a different way, this is this is a constraint on the square root of the diagonal entries of the ST of the of the vector program. I, I wrote CP here, but that's misleading. It's not necessarily a convex program, right? Um, and now it turns out um, I'm I'm not going to go too much into this because it's um, uh, sort of orthogonal to the rest of the talk. Uh, but it turns out that. This this quantity is convex for a rich class of norms known as two convex norms. Okay, and this is this turns out to precisely coincide with a well-studied class and function analysis. Okay, so it's convex if and only if x is what is known as um, if x is firstly sign invariant and also um, and also it, it has two convexity constant one. Okay, and Lauer and Shetman showed that. The convex program achieves achieves a constant factor approximation, um, assuming assuming a mild additional assumption about uh, concavity of x. Okay, um, but in particular, their their approximation algorithm gets a log a log n approximation, unconditionally, so without this condition. Okay, um, so this is a much richer class for which uh, quadratic maximization is possible. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Um, is it, uh, I mean, I don't know if people tried, but instead of uh, asking for this vector to be in ball of X, it can be in, uh, you know, in, in ball of some other uh, uh, space Y where uh, there is maybe a constant um, factor embedding between the two. Right, uh, uh, right, this constant distortion to X. That's an excellent question. Um, in fact, uh, I mean, this is not quite how our approach works, but, uh, but, uh, but it, it turns out that, that you, can, um, you can get algorithms in much, much more general settings implicitly by considering what you said. Um, so it, you know, the, this property of, of the square root diags being in ball of X, this, this quantity being convex, is a very sensitive property to the norm x. So if, if you if you perturb the norm x slightly, this property breaks down. Whereas uh, the property that Avi is mentioning, if, if you sort of slightly perturb the norm x, uh, being equivalent to some exactly two convex norm is a much more robust property. And uh, and and unfortunately, one can't one can't get results in general um, uh, uh, doing this because. Because it's not clear what this equivalent norm y is in general, and uh, we'll see some impossibility results in this direction. Can I also ask a question? Sure. Yeah. So, what is the algorithm for now in this now and Jeffman result? I mean, is it the same? How do you use the, the convexity of this? Um... Right. So, so it's the same ellipsoid method. So you're assuming a separation oracle. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if you have a membership oracle for X, um, uh, you can get a separation oracle by standard convex optimization machinery. Okay. So we already, like, this is the third example where you're showing us an algorithm where the set we're optimizing over is convex. But in the first example, we got a log n approximation, and then we saw a constant factor. And here it's a constant factor. So how can I predict in advance what will be the approximation factor 
Right. So it it seems it seems to be the case that this is closely connected to um, the type two constant of a norm, which I will define later in the talk. Um, so it's something you're going to address. Yes. yes. Cool. Okay. Thanks. But it's basically a property of the rounding algorithm, not of the relaxation. Right. But what I'm curious is how. I mean, you're trying to. The thesis here is that the geometry is 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 the key, right? So, trying to understand how is the geometry related to the rounding algorithm? Yeah. Right, right. Um, well, it's, it seems I don't know if it's true, but it seems to be related to the ability to achieve at the same time both independence and uh, as close to unit direction as you can in that space. Yeah, at, at this point, I guess I don't, um, I don't have physical intuition for when it's easy, um, uh, but I, I, I can give some, yeah, I, I suppose later on in the talk, I will try and give some intuition for, yeah, what it is about the geometry that makes it easy. Um, cool. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so, so let's, let's view yet another example. So now Chatenpina that I mentioned earlier in the talk. Uh, so as, as a reminder, the P norm of a matrix is defined as the LP norm applied to the singular values of the matrix. Okay. So, so now we're maximizing, uh, you know, like now our instance is an N square cross N square matrix mapping N cross N matrices to N cross N matrices. So we maximize AIJ KL times XIJ XKL. Um, such that the Shatten P norm of X is at most one. So X, little x is a matrix now, N cross N matrix. And uh, yeah, again, we, we look at a certain natural vector relaxation. It's debatable how natural this, this thing is, uh, but, and, and I don't expect you to parse this, but uh, I, I just want you to see that there is some constraint one can add and it involves off diagonal entries, which is a departure from, from um, previous uh, slides I showed you. Um, it involves off diagonal entries. There is some constraint one can add such that this program is convex if and only if P is at least two. And indeed, implicit in the work of Lust Picard, who proved non commutative Kinchin inequality, implicit in his work is a constant factor approximation when P is less than infinity and a log n approximation when P is equal to infinity. So for Shatten infinity, quadratic maximization, you get a log n approximation, just like for. L infinity. So this constraint is just about the inner product. It gives you a matrix, this constraint, and just the inner products of the correlation matrix X. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and so if, if you think of this matrix bold X as a, as a rank one N square cross N square matrix. So it's V, V transpose, where V is an N cross N matrix, then this, this quantity produces exactly V. It produces the matrix V. So on, on uh, rank one objects, it, uh, it exactly recovers the object um, that you want to put inside this unit ball. And, uh, and, and the way you, you come up with this constraint is is you force yourself to, to be exact on rank one objects, to exactly recover the object on rank one objects. And, and then you just apply linearity of expectation um, so, that, so that you're uh, you know, linear in the inner products. Well, here you're not quite linear. You know, it's a, um, sort of this operation that takes VV transpose to V somehow corresponds to square root here. Thanks. Okay, so, uh, right, so there is some constraint. And yeah, so this is yet another example, right? Um, right, so, so we've seen that, you know, all examples so far, uh, um, and this is true again of the examples I haven't mentioned yet, uh, so the examples I'm not going to mention in this talk, that uh, all, all approaches so far, uh, to my knowledge, basically define an exactly convex program. Um, and, uh, and solve this convex program and, and then round it. Okay. Um, 
right uh, in our generic framework we're we're going to depart from this and we're going to do approximate convex optimization in a similar vein to what avi said okay before that um, i i want to yeah, define an important quantity um, so you know an, an important classification tool from function analysis is the is the type 2 constant of a norm x okay it's denoted i'm going to denote it by t2 of x um, and this is a mouthful, but I'll try my best to familiarize people with this definition. Um, so it is defined as the smallest constant C, such that for every sequence of vectors, x1 through xm, the expected squared norm of a random Gaussian combination of the sequence is at most some constant C, is at most C times the L2 norm of the X, capital X norms of the vectors. Okay, um, so uh, as one example, if we take the sequence of vectors um, x1 through xm uh, as unit vectors in the capital X norm, this inequality is saying that the expected Gaussian combination of these vectors right, um, must lie deep inside the convex body. Much deeper than you would expect. Okay, so if I if I think of this as a convex combination and divided by n, um, this inequality is actually saying that uh, an exp the like a Gaussian convex combination of these unit vectors has norm c over square uh, yes yeah, c over square root n. So it's uh, it's like very deep inside the body. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure I, I remember all these things because it's uh, <laughs> uh, since this long ago, but uh, I think that uh, maybe a, um, maybe an intuitive way to think about this is uh, first of all to think maybe uh, of gamma i as being plus minus one random variables. And if you think about this, it's sort of taking a random work, uh, this, this summation on the left is sort of a random work with the vectors. Uh, with the sequence of vectors, and uh, uh, you want that there be a lot of cancellation. Yes, yes, yeah, that's a good way of putting. Just a lot of cancellation, like a random walk on a line with plus minus one steps. Uh, you take n steps, and you are within root n of the origin. Yeah, and uh, I guess this is a generalization uh, of. Uh, of this to you know to any any the vectors in any node and uh, uh, you want the same to happen i mean c controls how close to the origin you are uh, when you take this uh, random steps now with different uh, the step sizes in f every uh, well, step sizes are determined not by just plus or minus one left or right but the arbitrary uh, sequence of vectors yeah, yeah, that's a great point. In fact, um, uh, whether you do plus minus one or Gaussian, uh, the constant changes by an absolute constant. Yeah, it's the same. And uh, I guess the two in the type two refers to the fact that you take the two norm and they have other types. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, I, uh, one of the identities that L2 norm satisfies is, is the parallelogram law. Um, this is one direction of the parallelogram law. So it's, it can also be viewed as a generalization of the parallelogram law. Right. Um, so yeah, another, another way to get intuition for this maybe is that uh, uh, it, it turns out under some, under some additional assumptions, um, having bounded type two constant is equivalent to some quantitative, quantitative notion of smoothness. So that is, X is equivalent to a norm Y, uh, C equivalent to a norm Y that is that is very smooth um, in some quantitative manner, um, if and only if it has bounded type two. Okay. Uh, so I'll I'll try and give some more examples, maybe to try and familiarize people with this notion. Um, uh, right. So so in the LP case, whenever P is at least two and strictly less than infinity, so p is finite, um, the type two is a constant, okay? In fact, it, it grows roughly as square root p. And uh, 
and whenever uh, when p is infinity the type 2 constant is square root log n okay on the other hand when p is less than 2 the type 2 constant is polynomial in n okay where n is the dimension of the norm recall okay uh, similarly let's look at chat in p so again when our, whenever p is at least 2 and uh, it's finite we get a constant type 2 is a constant okay so roughly square root p again and uh, the type 2 of shatten infinity is square root log n and again when p is less than 2 the type 2 constant is polynomial in n okay right and uh, here is another fact so the unit ball of x is approximately an ellipsoid if and only if the type 2 constant of x and the type 2 constant of the dual of x is bounded. Okay, so, so actually one can use type 2 to characterize when a norm is roughly an ellipsoid, okay, roughly L2 up to linear transformation. Okay, um, however, on the, uh, you know, I, I, I should caution people um, if only T2 of x is bounded and P2 of the dual is not bounded then the norms can be polynomially far apart. Okay, so if only T2 of x is bounded, then ball x can be square root 10 far from any ellipsoid. Okay, and you know, this can easily be seen by taking, um, say, you know, L1000 or uh, L infinity. Okay, it's basically square root n over log n far from a, a, any linear transformation of L2. Um, on the other hand, the type 2 is bounded by at least square root log n. Okay, um, and uh, here, here I'm going to concretely mention the Ramsey theoretic fact I was alluding to earlier in the talk. Um, so a, a very important result of PCA is that um, if, if the type two constant of X is polynomial, so it's n to the delta say, um, then, then there exists some P strictly between one and two, such that X contains a copy of LP up to linear transformation, it contains a polynomial dimensional copy of LP. Okay, what do I mean by this? If I take the unit ball of X and I intersect it with a subspace of polynomial dimension, there exists a subspace of polynomial dimension that I can intersect the unit ball of X with such that um, the, the lower dimensional convex body I obtain looks like LP up to a linear transformation. For some one less than p less than two. Okay. Here you mean exactly like uh, LP or Up one to plus minus epsilon? One plus minus epsilon okay. for any fixed constant epsilon. Okay. okay, and yeah, so this this result is going to is going to be important for us, and we're going to use it soon. Uh, Vijay, just one question about the first point. Uh, yeah. The C approximation by ellipsoid. This is the same as uh, saying that there is a constant distortion uh, uh, linear transformation between X and L2. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, so I, you know, I, I hope it's it's clear now from from these you know various aspects that that type two is sort of it's an important classification tool. Right, so um, for instance, it can characterize when you're close up to linear transformation to L2. Um, and if the type two grows uh, like very quickly, then it gives you some information about the, the sections of this convex body. Okay, right, so, you know, uh, indeed, uh, you know, where, where, like one would think that, uh, you know, given this, Given how similar this uh, picture looks to to what we saw in the LP case, one would think that type two predicts approximability, and uh, indeed, you know, here's a result in this direction. Uh, so, if the type two constant of X grows polynomially large, uh, grows polynomially quickly, um, then there is no polytime approximation, uh, al uh, constant approximation algorithm for quadratic maximization unless the small set expansion hypothesis is false. That is, small set expansion has a, has a polytime approximation algorithm. Okay. Um, 
I'll briefly sketch the proof. Okay. Uh, so it, 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 the proof essentially involves two ideas. So the first idea is that quadratic maximization can, can enforce a subspace constraint. Okay, so if, I, if I'm maximizing X transpose AX, such that X is in some subspace V, right? Uh, and X is also in the unit ball of capital X, then I can, um, I can capture this quantity by, quadra by naive quadratic maximization. That is X transpose A minus pi X, where X is in the unit ball of capital X. And pi is the projector to the orthogonal complement of V. And uh, I actually have a typo here. Uh, I scale this projector pi by, by you know, a sufficiently large factor. Okay, so by, by just adding a penalty term, the projector of the orthogonal complement of the subspace V, um, I can essentially simulate quadratic maximization with a subspace constraint by just plain quadratic maximization. Okay, this equality is also a lie. It, it holds within you know, one plus minus inverse polynomial error. Say, okay. Um, the error, of course, determ uh, depends on how much we scale this projector. Right, so, so, so we can enforce a subspace constraint in quadratic maximization. Now combining this with the fact that I mentioned earlier, specifically that if the type two constant of a norm grows too quickly, then there is some section up to linear transformation that looks like LP, where P is between one and two. Okay, so using these two facts, we can, we can solve quadratic maximization over LP, where P is less than two, using quadratic maximization over capital X. Okay, um, so this, is, this is our reduction. But this assumes that you know how to find this section? Yes, yes. Um, uh, well, I, I should point out that simply the existence of such a section implies a non-uniform hardness result. That is, if there is a family of circuits um, uh, computing, computing quadratic maximization over capital X, then there is also a family of circuits computing um, uh, small set expansion. But is it not true that the random yeah. section has this property in many cases? Right, uh, right, right. So indeed, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so this is not quite a random section in the in the traditional sense. Um, it's not a it's not a rotation invariant distribution. It's a, a p-stable random matrix. Uh, but yeah. kind of what kind of matrix? Uh, uh, it's a it's a random matrix with p-stable random entries. Okay, well, I'm not sure what that is, but okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so a p-stable a p -stable random variable is a random variable satisfying the following property. Summation ai xi, where ai is a scalar and xi is, is an iid copy of the random variable. Summation ai xi has, has the same distribution as LP norm of A times x where X is an IID copy of the distribution. Okay, that's yeah. good for now. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's some magical random variable that turns out it only exists for P at most two. Um, for intuition, a two stable random variable is exactly the Gaussian random variable. But yeah, so, so the matrix looks like this. But yes, to answer your question, there is a, uh, there is a random matrix one can sample that with high probability satisfies this. So actually this is, uh, under randomized reductions. Right. Okay, yeah, so, so now, you know, when, when type two grows too quickly, um, we have hardness, right? On the other hand, if type two is constant, you know, we might hope for an algorithm, but it turns out even, even this is hard sometimes, right? Uh, and, and, and here, actually, the hardness result is quite simple. Uh, recall, you know, since quadratic maximization captures bilinear maximization, and since bilinear maximization has this operator norm interpretation, by, by simply considering the identity operator, quadratic maximization can actually capture 
the L2 radius of a convex body C. Okay. Um, so if we think of a linear map from the norm corresponding to C to, to L2, and we take the identity map, the, the operator norm of the identity map from mapping C to L2 is exactly the L2 radius of C. Okay, and it turns out that this problem itself has a strong lower bound. Okay, the, the example is really simple. You take the Euclidean unit ball, and then you plant a random long vector, let's say of like polynomial length, uh, chosen judiciously, right, in a random direction. And then you take the convex hull, right? And it turns out if you only have membership oracle access to this convex body C, um, you can't even estimate the L2 radius of this body within a polynomial factor, okay? Even with uh, sub-exponentially many queries, okay? Now, this is a very simple information theoretic lower bound, okay? Um, so, you know, you know, because of this hardness itself. Why, why is the, uh, it's easy to see that the uh, type two doesn't change much because uh, it's, Right, right. Uh, good question. Yes. Um, yeah, it is. It's a. It's a simple calculation. So the long vector will be polynomially long with some polynomial. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you you use the fact that uh, um, uh, sort of. I mean, yeah. You 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 planted with uh, uh, you you planted with a small enough polynomial factor that uh, it's, it's sort of less than even square root n. Yeah. Which yeah. is which is the like contribution the of one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Right. So. Right. So so we yeah it turns out one still has a strong lower bound. So it uh, you know similar to the case of convex optimization where you know one has to. Um, sort of investigate on a case by case basis the existence of separation oracle. Um, it seems that we might have to do the same for quadratic maximization, right? Um, but uh, yeah, we still propose you know a generic framework uh, that can that can recover what was known before, uh, right? So as a reminder, again, you know we're solving uh, maximize x transpose a x such that x is in the unit ball of capital X, and. Uh, and now motivated by the Gaussian rounding from earlier, we, we give a, you know, a relaxation that is not convex, okay? Um, so we just maximize A inner product bold X, such that bold X is PSD. And the expected squared norm of a Gaussian sampled from bold X must be at most one, okay? This is motivated by Gaussian rounding from earlier. Um, and of course, by the earlier analysis verbatim, we actually obtained that you know that nothing has changed. So the, the value of this relaxation is equal to opt. Right? Of course, note that this is not convex. Um, the connection to type two is like actually now becomes evident uh, in that this program, while it's not convex, is is approximately convex. I will define what this means in a moment. It's approximately convex within a factor of type two of x squared. Okay, so we so we actually have a certain generic relaxation, but that when type two is small, this generic relaxation is approximately convex. It turns out that approximate convex optimization cannot be done in general. Okay, um, even you know g given a membership oracle for uh, uh, for the set, if it's approximately convex, you can't even get a polynomial factor approximation. This is implicit in the lower bound I showed on the previous slide. Um, but we do show that you know you can just extend the ellipsoid the ellipsoid method um, with the following assumption. Right? So if if this set x PST such that Gaussian norm is at most one has an alpha approximate separation oracle, which I will define in a moment, then in poly time one can compute an alpha approximation to opt. Okay. What do I mean by an alpha approximate separation oracle? This time, whenever a point is outside an alpha scaling of the body, you have an algorithm to return a hyperplane separating the body from the point. Okay. And by the approximate convexity fact I mentioned earlier, 
whenever alpha is at least type 2 of x squared, such a hyperplane always exists. Finding such a hyperplane is not clear, right? There's not necessarily an algorithm to find this for a norm x, but, but such a hyperplane always exists, okay? Establishing this result is, is not hard at all. It's, it is essentially, it's essentially a modification of the ellipsoid method I mentioned um, in the earlier slides. Right. Again, we, we reduce, we reduce um, uh, maximization of this program. We reduce maximization of this program to you know, log in many feasibility subproblems. Right? And we solve each feasibility subproblem using the ellipsoid method with the caveat that um, if the algorithm stops, or, so, or sorry, if the separation oracle says that it can't find a separating hyperplane, we know that the point belongs to alpha in an alpha scaling of the body, okay? And therefore, we just return the point x divided by alpha, okay? And this will lose us an objective value of alpha, okay? So basically, by a very naive generalization of the ellipsoid method, um, one can obtain this theorem, okay? So, so I, I'm going to refer to this body as the covariance body. So it's a set of covariance matrices that have Gaussian norm at most one. Okay. So so we just we essentially just shifted the target. And so we said that you know um, if you can design an approximate separation oracle for this for this body uh, for this covariance body, then you have an approximation algorithm to quadratic maximization. Okay. But one feature that it has, and this goes back to what Avi is saying, is that this is now robust to, to perturbations in X, and we will, we will see evidence of this soon. Okay, so uh, approximate convex optimization seems to be the right, the right way to go. So this is, this is in some sense, um, one of the basic ideas that separates our approach from previous approaches. We abandon convexity and go for approximate convexity. Right. Um, and now, you know, we, we, we merely rephrase the question. So now, um, what has this bought us? Well, it turns out that one can use classical tools from Banach space theory to design separation oracles for, for this covariance body in various contexts, okay? And we, we, we do this, we design separation oracles in various contexts to obtain the following results, okay? Um, so first of all, we get the following closure property. So if you can, yeah, if you can approximately solve quadratic maximization over C1 and over C2, then you can also do it over their intersection. Okay, here by, here by an approximation algorithm, I mean a search approximation algorithm. So the approximation algorithm must, must give a vector X belongs to C1, such that it's within alpha of the optimum. Okay, so if you give me such an algorithm for C1 and for C2, then I can give you an algorithm for C1 intersection C2. Okay, it's also and close. What happens to the approximation factor? Ah, right, yeah, good point. Yeah, so I also need the bounded type two assumption, which is of course necessary. Um, uh, the approximation factor gets multiplied by a polynomial factor of type two. In fact, I think type two square. And uh, when you have C1 and C2, one is an alpha approximator and B, uh, the other is beta approximator, what do you get? It'll be max of alpha comma beta times T2 squared. Okay. okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the guarantees will be similar for most of the bullets I'm going to mention next, uh, except the type two can sometimes scale up by polynomial factors. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so yeah. So another example is a Minkowski sum. That is uh, the Minkowski sum of C1 and C2 is the set of vectors U plus V where U belongs to C1 and V belongs to C2. It's also closed under the quotient operation. So let me define this. I apologize, I won't have too much time to familiarize people with these notions. Um, so I'll just define them at a surface level. Um, right, so given a norm X and given a subspace V, one can, one can define a, a quotient norm always um, as follows. Uh, so the, the quotient norm X, um, x slash v of, of little x is defined as the distance of little x to the subspace v, but the distance is measured in the capital X norm. 
okay and then we think of x as being a member of the quotient vector space okay rn minus v in this case okay so this defines a new norm on the quotient space rn minus v okay and it turns out that you know if if you have bounded type 2 and you have an algorithm then then you also have an algorithm for any quotient okay right and uh, yet another closure property that we obtain is uh, closure under interpolation so uh, again here i i won't have time to define this formally because it's quite elaborate but there is a generic beautiful method to interpolate between two convex sets c1 and c2 in a smooth manner for theta between 0 and 1 when theta is 0 you get c1 when theta is 1 you get c2 and when theta is in the middle you get some smooth interpolant between these convex bodies as an example if you interpolate l1 and l infinity with theta equals half you get l2 okay but interpolating say you know the l1 norm and say shatten infinity norm can give you you know some very complicated uh, norm with with uh, complicated behavior okay i want to point out that in points 2 3 and 4 um it is it is highly unclear what the convex relaxation should be what an exactly convex program should look like and it's um I mean, I may even conjecture that such a program doesn't exist. Uh, uh, that is a computable exactly convex program. Okay, so I, I somewhat believe that approximate convex optimization is necessary for these three results. Right. Um, I just I just want to point out one of the closure properties that I missed out on in this list is closure under subspaces. But as I showed you earlier in the hardness result, um, closure under taking subspaces is straightforward by just adding a penalty term, the projector to the orthogonal subspace. Okay, and this this closure property is true regardless of type two. It's it's true, you know, with no assumption on the norm x. Okay, right. So some other results we get. So if you if you assume some you know some special properties of the norm, that is, it's symmetric. Uh, formally, I mean that it's symmetric to permutation and flipping signs. Um, then we obtain a, a Raghavendra type theorem, like a dichotomy theorem. That is, there is an algorithm achieving a polynomial in type 2 approximation for quadratic maximization. And moreover, if this, if this algorithm fails badly, that is, the type 2 constant grows polynomially quickly, there is no two to the log to the one minus epsilon approximation algorithm for quadratic maximization. So if this algorithm fails, every algorithm fails. Assuming the small set expand, uh, assuming small set expansion doesn't have a quasi poly time algorithm. Okay. Um, and similarly, we, we obtain this for the more general case of unitarily invariant matrix norms. Okay, so this in particular co covers the Shatten P case. Okay, uh, so those are our main results, right? And uh, uh, the the approach we take that is uh, sort of common to many of the results that I mentioned, most of them, um, but not quite all, is is that uh, we we reduce quadratic maximization of A to a series of PSD quadratic maximization subproblems. That is, we reduce quadratic maximization to a series of sub problems where the instance has the additional property that it's positive semi definite okay this reduction loses a factor of type 2 of x squared okay and the second step is that uh, you know quadratic maximization in the psd case is often easier to deal with okay um, i again i'm i'm not going to be able to flesh out either one or two completely but i will i will try and uh, mention a little bit about both in the rest of the talk um, I'm sorry, I guess I forgot, I forgot about giving people a break. Do, do people want to take a five minute break? I guess the speaker is the person who mostly needs a break. So uh, it's up to you. Do you want huh. to take a quick break now and then, uh, or just keep going? I can keep going. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I don't want to, uh, yeah, I mean, if someone wants a break, speak out now or whatever, hold your peace, I suppose.
Okay, no one, yeah, okay. No one at least wants to publicly say they want a break. The suspense is killing us. <laughs> right. Um, okay, yeah, so, so let's, uh, let's carry on, I suppose. Right, so as a reminder, we have two steps. So we, we reduce to the positive semi-definite to a series of positive semi-definite subproblems. And, uh, and it turns out that positive semi-definite subproblems are somewhat easier to deal with. Okay, I'll try and illustrate the second point now. All right. So it's this, uh, the key simple observation that, uh, or uh, the key pair of simple observations that, that, uh, uh, that underlie why the positive semi-definite case is easier is the following. Um, so let A be a PST matrix. So A is equal to B transpose B. Right? And by simple you know, manipulation, X transpose AX is equal to the inner product of BX with BX. So the L2 norm squared of BX. Right? Now, you know, recall, this is simply the definition of the X to two operator norm of B. Right? So it's like the maximum, the maximum L2 norm squared, uh, you know, uh, the maximum amount that B scales and, and a capital X unit vector in the L2 norm. Okay, trivial manipulation yields this, right? Um, and again, you know, recall, you know, this this norm has a bilinear definition, right? So we can alternatively rewrite it as maximize y transpose bx, where y is in the L2 unit ball, and x is in the capital X unit ball. Right? Simple rearrangement gives this is the same maximum of b transpose y inner product x. Just using the fact that y inner product b x is equal to b transpose y inner product x. Right? Now recall that this is the same, you know, by again this bilinear maximization and operator norm connection. This is the same as the two to x star norm of b transpose. Okay. Um, so what happened here is that is that we showed that quadratic maximization of a PST matrix has two equivalent definitions. It's the x to two norm of B squared, and it's also the two to x star norm of B transpose squared. And somehow this access to x star norm is very convenient. Okay. Uh, BJ? Yes. Uh, the, this equality, the last equality in the top line is, uh, you can replace two by any P, right? The two norm by, I mean, what generic? Uh, no. No, it's just two. It holds only for the two now. Yes, yes. Um, what you're saying is true if I, if I replace it with an inequality. So it is true that quadratic maximization X of B transpose B is at most the X to P norm of uh, uh, B times the P star to X star norm of B transpose. Something like that. Oh, P star. Yeah. Okay. So if I, yeah. So what's special in the second inequality is that uh, two stays the same. If you put P in the left hand side there, like in the middle, then you get P star in the other side. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and okay. but this is generic. This is uh, right. But but it is true that so this won't hold at any. It it won't hold at equality if you replace two by a different P. I was just asking about the second inequality, not the. Oh, oh, that. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, as you said, yes. Uh, any any norm y that I put here, uh, here will become y star. Okay, thanks. Right, right. And indeed, the the proof of what Avi is saying. Yeah, thanks for reminding me. The proof of what Avi is saying is is just you know it's exactly this. Just you know replacing L two by more general norms. Yeah. Right. Okay, yeah, so, so this, this access to X star, you know, in this, in this case is sometimes very convenient. So for example, um, we, can, we can actually see that uh, this algorithmic closure property that, that we saw earlier is, is trivial in the PST case for Minkowski sum, okay? Um, so I'm going to denote X plus Y as a Minkowski sum of the unit balls of the two norms, right? So quadratic maximization over X plus Y or B transpose B is actually equal 
to the maximum of B transpose two to X star norm squared and B transpose two to Y star norm squared. Okay, the, the, the reason one gets this is, is the dual of the Minkowski sum has a, has a very nice explicit description. So the, so the norm uh, X Minkowski sum Y, um, its dual is actually the maximum of the X star norm and the Y star norm, that's it. Okay. And uh, yeah, so simply, simply staring at definitions yields the following e equality. So quadratic maximization over the Minkowski sum of B transpose B is simply quadratic maximization of B transpose two to X star, sorry, is simply two to X star norm of B transpose squared and two to Y star norm of B transpose squared, the maximum of the two, okay? So now one can see that if, if you have an algorithm for quadratic maximization over X and one over Y, you can use the algorithm over X to solve this problem easily. And you can use the algorithm over Y to solve this problem easily. And then, yeah, just combining the two, you get, a, you get an algorithm for the Minkowski sum. Okay. Right. Similarly, um, in, in the design of uh, separation oracles, um, uh, why this helps in other contexts, uh, I'm not going to go too much into detail, but uh, it turns out when, when the type two constant of X is bounded, um, it's often the case that, that Gaussian, the, the norms of Gaussians fluctuate less in the dual space, so in X star. Okay, as, a, as an example, um, let's say we take, you know, X as L infinity, uh, right? And uh, let G1 through, B, through Gn be possibly correlated standard Gaussian, so unit variance, zero mean, right? Then the, the expected maximum squared is it's always in the interval one comma order log n, okay? It turns out. Um, and then this is tight. Uh, for independent Gaussians, the right-hand side is tight. And for, you know, entirely correlated Gaussians, the left-hand side is tight. On the other hand, the expected L1 norm squared, right? Which is the dual of L infinity, right? So the expected L1 norm squared divided by n squared is in a constant width interval. It's in, it's in between two over pi and one. Okay, this is a consequence of uh, a generalization of Kinchin inequality, if you've heard it. Okay, um, so it, it turns out that uh, that this fluctuation is much less in the dual world, and and uh, this is a very very high level reason for saying that uh, PSD the PSD version of Grothendieck's inequality is easier than than uh, the full version of Grothendieck's inequality, or moreover, the quadratic version of Grothendieck's inequality. Okay, so, right, so, we, so we've seen two reasons why PSD maximization might be um, a little more tractable than quadratic maximization. Okay. Um, uh, and now, you know, I'm, I'm going to go back to step one. Okay, so in step one, I promise that I'll give a reduction from quadratic to PSD maximization, to a series of PSD maximization instances. Okay, so I'm, I'm trying, uh, I will try and sketch uh, the main ideas involved. Uh, so yeah, so suppose you know we have a we have a matrix A and uh, we have this factorization B transpose C B. Okay, um, and by simple manipulation, you know X inner product A X is equal to B X inner product C B X. Right? Now, simply applying the definition of the maximum eigenvalue of C. Right. The Raleigh quotient definition of the maximum eigenvalue of C, this is at most the maximum eigenvalue of C times the L2 norm squared of, of the vector that it's being applied to. So that is Bx. Right. So the L2 norm squared of Bx. Right. And now, you know, just by definition, right, this is the capital X to 2 norm of B squared times the maximum eigenvalue of C. Okay, so, so we just, you know, we derived a trivial upper bound on the, op on the quadratic maximization value of A, which is this, right? So the quadratic maximization over A is at most this quantity trivially, always, for any factorization B transpose C B, okay? Right. Um, now, now, 
we 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 essentially show a converse of the statement that is we we show that there always exists a factorization a is equal to b transpose c b such that the x to 2 norm of b is 1 and the maximum eigen value of c approximates quadratic maximization of a over x this first inequality is precisely what i showed you in the previous slide up to normalization and the second inequality is what's non trivial okay um so we so we show that there exists such a factorization okay and uh, uh, the way we prove this is you know uh, basically the the two ingredients are uh, you know several duality steps and and gaussian rounding so a rounding algorithm is hidden underneath uh, the proof of this fact okay um this you know this this type of result is closely connected to uh, an area of banach space theory that was studied in the 60s and 70s and 80s uh, called factorization theory um, and yeah there are several beautiful results in this area so uh, vijay yeah Yeah, maybe we can just see that it's trivial in the case that uh, x is a L2 norm and c2 is one. Right. In right, right. Good. Um, right. So if if x is the L2 norm, then the correct factorization to take is to take b as the identity matrix. So the matrix A itself. Um, the quadratic maximization over a is the is the maximum eigen value of a right and and we have this equality right um right and uh, and so so let's say i i told you that magically you were aware of this factorization so you had this factorization a is equal to b transpose cb um then then just you know you, you can you can approximate quadratic maximization over a just by computing the maximum eigen value of c right and and this is easy to do as we know right um so so it you know our task is to find such a factorization you know it turns out you can't find such a factorization in general right but we show that if if you have an oracle that solves psd quadratic maximization then you can you can always approximately find the best factorization as above okay so if you have an alpha approximate oracle for psd instance maximization you can find an alpha times type 2 of x squared approximation to quadratic maximization over a okay um right and and how do we show this well you know we 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 just you know apply the approximate ellipsoid method to a judicial judiciously chosen convex program okay so it turns out that uh, this factorization uh, problem and it's it's not hard to see um uh can be can be captured as follows okay so we minimize the quadratic maximization over x of a matrix w such that w is psd and w dominates a okay um and one can see why this exactly captures the factorization question i mentioned earlier by by considering the following substitution so take the optimal w right um and set b as w to the negative half and c as w to the half a w to the half okay um so simply simply you know multiplying this inequality by w to the negative half on both sides will tell you that c is at most the identity matrix therefore it's uh, um it's lambda max is at most one okay and then and then the you know the the value of quadratic maximization of a is hidden here so it's hidden in uh in the x to 2 norm of b here okay right so um right so if such a factorization exists we can approximately find such a factorization okay uh, and without working too hard right uh i mean intuitively um intuitively to solve this convex program we need an approximate separation oracle for the objective which is quadratic maximization over a psd matrix w right 
And it turns out that if you're given an oracle to approximately solve quadratic maximization, it's not too hard to design a separation oracle for this objective function being at most lambda. Okay, uh, so just basically using the approximate ellipsoid method that I was talking about, the variant of it, um, you can approximately find the best factorization, assuming a PSD maximization oracle. Okay, yeah. Um, so more generally, you know, this this uh, factorization is a is a broader phenomenon, and uh, uh, we we use we use you know more of these results to to get you know some additional consequences. So firstly, you know, I, I focus the talk today mostly on quadratic maximization, um, but we can use deeper factorization results, specifically one due to PCA, um, to show a stronger um, a stronger result in the bilinear case. What do I mean by this? Um, under a weaker assumption than bounded type two, so uh, specifically bounded dual core type two, which I uh, won't define. Under bounded dual core type two, we obtain closure properties for the bilinear case. We also obtain algorithms for norms with symmetries in the bilinear case using, using you know, other factorization theorems. Okay. Um, secondly, you know, closure under complex interpolation actually uses a different factorization result. Okay. Um, and uh, lastly, you know, and this is somewhat surprising to me, it turns out that quadratic and bilinear maximization can also be done over certain approximately convex sets. Not always, but uh, I can give some examples where you can, you can do quadratic maximization over approximately convex sets. And this uses a another you know more general factorization result okay uh, right so so let's just you know pictorially summarize what happened so far right so so prior to our work um there were these uh, very very general results for for uh, quadratic maximization over exactly two convex norms with some concavity assumption and there were also non commutative versions of this Okay, that is in the Shatten in the Shatten case. Okay, uh, for Shatten p norms, and uh, you know by designing separation oracles for this covariance body, um, we we generalize you know both these classes, right? As I mentioned earlier, um, you know even even when type two is constant, there are strong lower bounds. So this this green set, which is the set for which we get algorithms, is a strict subset of of the set of uh, norm sequences that have uh, type two constant, right? And we also, you know, obtain for some special families um, a dichotomy theorem. So, so in the case where for norms with symmetries and bounded type two, um, we get a constant factor approximation. And for unitarily invariant matrix norms, we get a constant factor approximation, right? And using our closure properties, we get all this connective tissue. So we can combine all these norms in non-trivial ways to obtain lots of new examples. In fact, a, a family of new examples of norms for which it's not evident what the convex programming relaxation is, yet we still get constant factor approximation. Yeah, just a reminder that the separation oracle probably doesn't exist in general. So it seemingly needs to be studied on a case-by-case -case basis. Right, um, that brings us to open questions. Uh, what are algorithms for other special families? Um, I have some in mind, uh, though they're technical to describe, I think, uh, over audio, um, for which it would be nice to get separation oracles. Right. And uh, our dichotomy theorem isn't quite sharp. So uh, I, I, think, I think if we assume small set expansion and the exponential time hypothesis, we can prove something on the lines of, um, you know, we have we have an algorithm that op that obtains a polynomial in type two approximation, and moreover, no algorithm can do better than type two of x to the one over log to the epsilon. Okay, and and this this presumably can be yeah I mean I don't know but uh, it would be amazing if this can be made sharp. Okay, it's not even clear what the right algorithm is for this that obtains the exact correct approximation factor, even for just symmetric norms, right? Um, we saw today that, uh, uh, you know, the approximate ellipsoid method 
is you know is is a step in this direction right um, right another question and one of my favorite questions is uh, can one show an np hardness result for lp quadratic maximization when p is less than 2 okay um, as as we showed earlier using embedding results this has far reaching consequences um, right and uh, lastly you know the bilinear case actually is um, is more subtle and you know it's like it's much more mysterious um, for example we don't even have a dichotomy theorem in the bilinear case like we had in the in the quadratic case even for symmetric norms um, this rests on some purely geometric conjectures that are open problems in banach space theory right that's it Okay, thank you very much. Ooh. It was quite a comprehensive talk and a lot of good results. Did anyone have any questions? Thank you, Jay. Andre, did you say you had a question? Or? No, no, I just think, I just think. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, you're, you're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, Vijay? Yeah. Uh, could you go back to like slide 43, I think? This is just the picture showing the dichotomy. So, uh, so yeah, yeah, perfect. So, um, so this isn't quite a, like a, like a sharp dichotomy theorem in the sense that if you assume there's a Gaussian separation oracle, you get an algorithm and you know there's hard cases where the type 2 constant is 1. Is there any conjecture for like what a hardness result for when the type 2 constant is one could be uh, right so so uh, are you referring still to the symmetric case yeah ah, so in the symmetric case there is no separation oracle it's unconditional so we get an unconditional algorithm um, that's polynomial and the type 2 in the symmetric case sorry I, I think my question was more about hardness um, yeah, yeah. So, so the hardness result is more general. So the hardness result says that whenever type two grows too quickly, yeah, um, you you don't have an algorithm. But there are hard, but there are type, but there are constant type two for which you do have hardness. Right, but, but and I mean, and I mean, the set of type two for which there's hardness isn't just when you don't have a Gaussian separation oracle, right? So I was wondering if you had an idea for what a more refined picture would uh, be. Ah, uh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. I understand now. Yeah. So such norms cannot be symmetric by by our algorithm. Or uh, unitary, right? Yeah, or unitary, exactly. Um, however, yes, um, that's a that's a great question. I think. So. <laughs> um, I, I think it's a very nice open question to show, you know, um, to show that somehow you can plant a vector um, in the in the same way we did in the Oracle lower bound uh, that that somehow encodes the solution to SAT, three SAT or something like that, um, and show that oh, if you can find the L two radius of this convex body with a planted vector in some direction, then then you can approximately solve three SAT or something like that. Um, and you know, taking it further, if you if you get a hardness factor that exceeds the type two of the body, so yeah, let's say the type two is constant, and you get a hardness factor of say log n or something like that, um, you can actually apply the closure properties that that we derived um, for hardness application. Oh, uh, right, yeah, um, right. But but yeah, I I, um, I the the reason you have an oracle lower bound when type two is constant is like. It's almost a silly reason, right? In that somehow uh, you you have a very limited algorithmic model, this membership query model. Yeah. And uh, and because of that, you can hide long vectors in some direction. Yeah, right, 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 right. That makes sense. Yeah. I and uh, I I mean, yeah, it's conceivably one can one can encode solutions to NP hard problems inside this direction. I don't know. Okay. Uh, cool. That, Thanks. Yeah, I think that's a nice question. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, going back to like the very basic special cases, like uh, <clears throat> uh, doing the quadratic maximization 
for two to four norms over the sphere. Mm -hmm. uh, do your algorithms improve or possibly improve because they are different? Uh, known algorithms for such problems? The approximation ratio for such problems? Uh, um, I guess we, we didn't focus too much on the, on the dependence on type 2 and co-type 2. But, uh, but yeah, conceivably, if one is extremely careful about the factorization constant, um, and uh, uh, I, I guess you're referring to polynomial approximations for 2 to 4 norm? Yeah, yeah. Um, they are non trivial. They use, uh, you know, the SOS, and uh, you, you are using uh, ellipsoid based methods, and maybe they uh, can do right. better. I mean, maybe still polynomial, but better, or well, anyway. Right, right. That's, that's a good question. Yeah, off the top of my head, I don't know. But uh, yeah, if one is careful about type 2, co-type 2 factorization, then it's, it's possible. Um, yeah, it's possible one can get a better polynomial. Uh, yeah, specifically for 2 to 4 norm, um, I, think, I think the best algorithm currently, like worst case approximation, is actually really silly. You just take the 2 to 2 norm and then you take the two to infinity norm, and then you take the product of those two and take the square root. And, it, and this is the best approximation in the worst case. And it, yeah, it gets square root n or square root n, whichever is the right dimension. Yeah. yeah. Uh, however, yeah, the, the SOS-based algorithms you're referring to are probably uh, either the Haro Montanaro additive approximation algorithm um, or the, the one for uh, random Barak, matrices. Uh, yeah, Barak Sarah and... Uh, right, right, yeah. So yeah. that one is for random matrices. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't think the techniques in this work will be helpful for random instances because, uh, uh, you know, they're so, somehow more geared to worst case. Well, it can be better in the worst case than their results on the average. <laughs> <laughs> right, but, but they get the constant factor approximation for uh, for uh, average yeah. case, and uh, and it would it would actually upset me greatly if there is a constant factor algorithm for two to four norm. <laughs> Okay, any more comments or questions? Okay, in that case, we will see you next week for Raghavendra's talk on Monday. <laughs>